Welcome to 1EMS. I am Charles Paul, and I'm here with Chief Johnson in Wayne County. And we're doing these conversations and talking to people so that everybody can have one voice in EMS and have their voice heard. And so, Chief, uh, yeah, we, this first day we've met each other. So, where'd you get started in EMS? Uh, I got started back in the early '80s, actually, as a volunteer fireman. Okay. And uh, took first responder. Uh, my career was actually in a county, and uh, became a volunteer. I took first responder. Um, went and uh, took the EMT course, just doing it as a, a volunteer in the county. And then uh, went ahead and went to paramedic school. I got, I liked it. Uh, I sat there for years looking at uh, the old green bar sheets, if you've seen those <laughs> yeah. in Smithsonian or something, and a calculator all day, doing accounts receivable for the hospital. Okay. Not a lot of excitement in that. Uh, so you're a, you're a medic at the time, and you're doing accounts receivable because that's what that's what paid the bills, wasn't it? Yeah. So it's always been a problem with pay and EMS. It's always been an issue. Absolutely. I got you. I got you. So you went from, how'd you get from accounts receivable in a hospital to the director of EMS in Wayne County? The uh, old EMS station there was actually located at, behind the hospital. Had a good friend uh, that was paramedic. He'd come by my office. Hey, guess what I just did? And, mm. uh, you know, it was it was appealing to me and exciting. So uh, just decided to change careers. Good. Most medics don't make it. She's like, we're talking about earlier before we started doing the, the interview. And I've said it before on, on camera that it's a dead end career right now for emergency medicine. You become an EMT. Well, now you become an EMT, you become an AEMT, and you become a medic. While there's opportunities, they're widespread. So you can leave and go be a set medic for the movie sets. You can go work in a doctor's office, but there's no upward mobility because once you get medic, what do you do? You leave the truck which is what you wanted to do in the first place, right? That's where the stories came from. That's what got you into it. Then you go get on a desk, right? You make a way for the next generation to come up. Or you go become nurses. You're telling me that mostly what you guys lose here, full-timers, is people going on to RN or, or PA school. Absolutely. So how do you, what are you doing in Wayne County to offset that and fix it? Well, um, we recently approached our commission uh, within the last year and they had to make the pay competitive. So uh, we got approximately a $5 uh, an hour increase over what they were paying to make it more attractive. Uh, but really the problem not only, you know, is, is the pay, and and we're competitive now, sure. and, and people are, are pleased is the availability of paramedics. Uh, just people applying. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to me that there's a lot of people just Getting out of the field or not going in the field, and uh, you know that's that's a problem. Yeah, it's very much a, a pyramid there. I went, I became an EMTI because I got in those levels before they changed them. And the reason I became a paramedic is I spent. I've always had a drive to do better and do more. And there's only so much you can do as an I or an A or, or any level that's not medic. And then there's a wider range of what you can do, but there's still a limit, but still more uh, than than other things you can do. I became a medic because I spent six months without a partner and having a new medic come through every shift to my house that didn't live with me, you know, there in the station. So I got tired of being told what to do by people who changed it every week. And that's the thing, though. Most people don't become medics because they want to do more. They become medics to get that pay raise. I know you teach an EMR school here and a, a EMT school. Have y'all looked at doing paramedic school or helping your EMTs become medics? You know, that's a possibility in the future. Uh, we're, we're looking at a plan to grow our own. Farm our own people. Exactly, you gotta raise uh, them. Most of our people that's uh, in the EMR, I, I would say all of them, were our volunteer firemen, our fire personnel. Sure. And uh, th and those are the same people that's in the current EMTB class that we're doing, and hopefully we'll go to A and and look at it possibly in the future doing the paramedic class in house. I gotcha. I got it because you came up. You went to the Georgia State Composite Boards. I did. Did you? Yeah. yeah. The yeah. old uh, number two pencil. Yeah. The, the <laughs> bubble, bubble form, whatever you call yeah. it. Yeah. So much has changed in Georgia politics and in medicine. What's one of the biggest changes you've seen from when you were coming out and doing a paramedic to today what the EMTs deal with? You know, I guess the intervention of uh, all the uh, computers. I mean, I've seen a lot in my <laughs> lifetime. Uh, you know, uh, 
and, and the availability of resources. I was talking to my deputy chief yesterday, and I had a, uh, one of my good medics here, and quizzing them a little bit, you know, about beginning doses and stuff like that. And, you know, all these things, when we went to school, you had to commit the stuff to memory. Yeah. Now they rely a lot on, not that some of them don't, but sure, they sure. rely on their, their phones, they rely on, you know, electronics that mm-hmm. we didn't have. Uh, you just had to had to have the knowledge, right? The dopamine drip. You had to do the clock. Oh yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can figure one in my head within three drops, or right now. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's good because uh, when was the last time you hung dopamine? Uh, it's been a minute. Yeah, right. a lot of times, years. right? And you don't use the skill. So I can't do the clock anymore. I haven't done that skill in ten years. Not a lot so, of cane clock, or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, but that's all we had. Uh, you know, we didn't have all the. The, the electronics, and I think it's, that's a good thing. The technology is good, but okay. I think we become dependent on it sometimes. And when it fails, then it's going to be yeah, uh, it's, it's failure. So I run a non-emergency service, and we took out all the life packs because they're expensive, and we don't need them. We do no, we don't even do transfer. We do all dialysis, and every medic that works for me is like, what, what if what if they go into a cardiac arrest? Uh, what's the number one thing they teach you in school? Compressions and airway. That's it, man. Breathe for it. If you're a medic, tube them, but don't waste time. You're going right to the hospital. More than likely, you're going to be the only one in the back of the truck because there's no sense in pulling over and calling 911. Basics matter. And to that point, do you think that your current people that are working for you that came up with the age of electronics and the age of being able to look stuff up, do you think it hinders them a little bit when the calls go sideways? You know, I don't know of a problem, but I can see the potential for it okay. happening. Um, but now we've got age we didn't have. You know, we got the capnography, and we got some yeah. great tools that we yeah. we didn't have before. Um, so it comes in handy for running, you know, an emergency service. It's, and we've got a lot of things we don't necessarily have to have fluid warmers and Roslow bags. And remember what the fluid warmer used to be? We put it under our leg and sit yeah, on it while we're starting the dash, turn on the defroster <laughs> exactly. on the heat. Yeah, that was yeah. it. Uh, yeah. So we had to do a lot, I think some more improvising. But I, I think yeah. that, you know, the technology is good. Uh, it gives us tools for it. Get better care. I gotcha. In, in Wayne County, what's one of the things that, as a, a, the director, that you look at that if you do, I don't know, it's not one thing, but what, what do you look for when you promote people? And what is it that will get you out of the service faster than anything? Uh, you know, we we really haven't had a problem uh, of trying to get people out of the service, and we're a little unique here because all of our full time people are paramedics. We don't hire any EMTs. Or, oh, wow, okay. Uh, not in a full time capacity, but we utilize full EMTs um, to man our trucks. Sure. And we always run dual paramedics is is great. I can't get this guy to right. where you look at it or yeah. you know you got another equal there with you and and we've done that here historically forever as long as i've been here so so how does that affect your staffing are you you find yourself short staffed or is there enough emt pool to help balance we actually got approved uh when we got pay increase i was telling you about to hire uh eight more full-time people okay. and i think we've only we've hired one two three four so far uh but we, we're still Looking for eight, eight more people. So eight more paramedics. Now, you th- is, this county is huge. You said six hundred square miles, something like that. But not, not a huge population. So are you having to maybe? Are, is the pool too shallow here for for for, for double medics? Is what I'm asking. Like the hiring pool. Do you have to go outside? Uh, and how you how you reaching out to people? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, we've used social media. We've talked to the local. Uh, schools where they'd have paramedic programs and uh, we've been fortunate to to get some people uh, from neighboring counties uh, this isn't a real transit area not like Atlanta or yeah you know people that live yeah. here most of them are from here born here mm-hmm. you know so it's not a very transient area do you do anything more. with the high schools the kind of we do uh, yeah we do a job uh, career day okay with them uh, to, so. I know a lot of high schools have started teaching CPR as a class in high school. Some of them even do EMT 
in high school. So I know you have to be 18 to get licensed, but they can get the information and learn it. And if they want, they can get licensed when they get out of high school. I think that's awesome. I didn't, I didn't realize that was going on. It's rare. Uh, I didn't know either till last year or two. Somebody actually applied to my company and said that they'd gone to their high school class, their senior year, whatever, basically did EMT classes and graduated and then went and got their numbers. Um, and, and it's still less effective than EMT class. Because, you know, you're 16, 17, 18 years old, you think, oh, this seems cool. But, you know, when you get out of it, you go, well, we're talking about the competition. Your competition is not necessarily your county over. It's the target, right? It's the, the, the McDonald's that will pay you $12 an hour to not have to go out at 3 in the morning in the pouring rain and, and dig that car out of the ditch. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's a passion, EMS is. It's a calling, yeah. if you please. And the people that do it. They don't necessarily do it for the money. I mean, you got to have money to live, but they don't necessarily do it for the money. Right. Uh, it's like our volunteer firemen, our firefighters. They, you know, these guys are doing it as a, a service to their community, not right for money. And but, it feels but like, you got to survive too. So, well, it's not just you got to survive because money and everything you can make. I mean, Grady, Grady's downtown Atlanta. They did a five thousand dollar sign-on bonus last year. I don't know if it's still going on. Or last spring, rather. I mean, this calendar year. And yeah, you get people looking for money, but if all you're ever doing is running ragged and there's not enough people to cover their shifts, so you got to cover extra shifts, it, it won't matter. Even if you're not running ragged, if you get put, I, one of the worst stations I've put in was they repurposed a volunteer fire station and it was this upper room that they just put some bunk rooms in and a window unit for air conditioning. And it was obviously an afterthought. So we're getting paid little and being thrown in the attic, essentially. You don't feel value. I did take a tour. This is the newest building I'll have. And it's quite large and beautiful. And each room, you have each separate bunk rooms with bathrooms and you've got the TVs on the wall. You, you seem to value your people. Was that a hard decision to make or is that something you always knew you wanted to do? Uh, absolutely. No, it wasn't a hard decision. Getting the, uh, the funding to get it done was, right, it yeah. took some years, but, uh, you know, they did. They, and we built it for the future. Um, you know, I've seen so many things, especially in the government, they build something and five years later they've outgrown it and they've got to add on. Let's, let's build it big as it will ever need to be here. We'll need additional stations in the future and we already sure. know where those are going. But we wanted to build this. We can house, uh, three full-time crews here. Right. You know, and like you said, we, we wanted to build it, uh, it's their home. Instead of yeah. away from home, a lot of times they, they're here more than a home. <laughs> you do 24, 48? Well, they actually here, they do 24, they pull call 24 hours. Okay. And then they're all 48. All right, so tell me about that. So, okay, so it's kind of 24, 72s, but how do you do the on call? Okay, well, they work 24 hour shifts. Sure. And ours happens to be 8 to 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. Then they're on call. After eight, and, and the reason we have that or need it here because the local hospital they have limited uh, services available, so we do a good many transfers. Okay. So we pay them um, so many dollars an hour, regardless if they come in or not. That if we have a transfer hotel and you come in and cover the county while the people that are working twenty four are gone. So, right. And how often do you have to trigger that? Every day. Okay. Sometimes multiple times a day. So basically they might come in for a few hours from one or two calls and then the other crew comes back and they're back on call doing their, their life, whatever. Yeah. All right. And then they have two solid days off after that. Yeah. And it's like I tell people, well, now uh, we have to change what we tell them. Uh, you can make uh, $19 million here if you work a million hours. <laughs> <laughs> Simple math. Yeah. And a lot of them do. Uh, uh, not $19 million, but hours sure. you know yeah I mean, that's very demanding yeah yeah that's that is it. so one of the stories i like to tell is is the part of one of EMS is educating everybody on the differences and i had not heard of the systems so i'm learning something that's different and somebody else is going to hear this and go oh we can try that of, of how you cover extra shifts or, or the gaps it's not always just put up extra trucks and throw more money and more people at it sometimes it's just repurposing what you have in a better way. But the story I tell sitting at a, I was at a finance meeting as a paramedic living in the county 
on duty and the two retired commissioners were sitting there because anybody could come to the meeting and they're digging through the budget and they're picking apart because we were doing 2448. So you're automatically getting overtime, which in yours, you're, you might separate it with the billing on, on active duty versus on call, but you're still building overtime somewhere in there. Um, especially if they pick up extra shifts or whatever. And they're like nitpicking the overtime. Well, can't you just hire someone for eight hours or 12 hours? And I, I was in a bad spot and I, I lost my mind for a second and, and uniform and everything. And they weren't actual commissioners, but still it was inappropriate. But I just said it in very plain paramedic speak, which is four letter words of, I don't make more than 30,000 a year. I'm, I can't hardly pay my bills. And at three in the morning, I'm still running these calls and you want to take that away from me. And that's another thing too. Yeah, it's demanding the way we do it. But generally speaking, I don't think any of our full time people have another full time job. See, that's or the another key. job. They can make right? enough here if they want to work. Uh, you know, to not have to uh, have a, a part time. All job. right. See, so that's what I'm dealing with in my company, trying to educate my people. And I hire because we do non emergency. I, I do hire share out of school, so they don't have the advantage of working for some other places that aren't as good and trying to educate them. I was like, we always have shifts open, especially on Saturdays. Pick up the shift. You'll make overtime. We try to keep overtime down, but overtime is available if we're taking care of the patients. How did you get your people to buy in on that? This is it. I'm taking care of here. Uh, well, they know that up front if they want to work here and what the requirements are. And we also use uh, the on-call staff if someone were to call out that day or you know something come up I'm sick or whatever and they could be forced I'm going uh, to ask some questions shift. about the actual money on that side I'm, okay. I'm very interested in, in having an well, on-call call time I don't mind telling you it's three dollars yeah. an hour okay. whether they come in the door or not now when they come in the door they're it clocking change? in at server time okay all right so it's just okay. they're scheduled 84 hours working like we do they own them Twice a month on Mondays, they work a 12-hour shift. So it works out 84 hours a pay period with four shifts. So they get four hours built in overtime, and anything else they come in is, is time and a half. Wow. And our new starting pay is a oh, little yeah. over 19 an hour, walking in the door. As an EMT or as a medic? As a medic. Oh, that's right, you're in double medic. So then I'm assuming it's a little bit less for the EMT full part-time? 14, 59, maybe 39. That's so good for we EMTs. Want, well, you know, we want to be competitive. And, and, you know, we've been lucky, too, because we do uh, allow clinicals uh, to be written here by... That's a great recruiting a tool, right? Of three different entities, I think, uh, schools. And uh, so some of those folks, uh, you know, have gone to... Did clinicals here and came back interested in working here. So that's, yeah. that's helped, too. That is... that is I, I use that on the lower end the EMT because obviously you do the medics, which is what they need all those ride times. It's, you're right. It's, it's also an interview. I've had plenty of students come through, and my medics go, mm, "If they apply here, don't don't talk to them." But more than like more, what happens is, I hope when you're finding the same thing is, they'll let's see what we can do to get this person. They they really on point. They listen because that's the key is people listening. Um, did Wayne? I know in your career you did this, but in Wayne County, did you do a traditional twenty four forty eight and then a change to the system? No, it's always been it's always way. been this way. It's always been this way. That's bad. Since the seventies. Why is this not why am I only hearing about California shifts, which I still can't wrap my mind around, and then straight twenty four forty eight or twelves that run you ragged. You know, this is if it's been around forever, we this is why we do these conversations, is it get It works for us right now. Is but it, on the other part of that is is some people don't want to apply because of the required call. Sure. I don't want to pull a call after I've been there twenty four hours. And I and I get that. But if it works for you and you don't want to have to work two or three jobs, you know, we got a place for you. It sounds like you know what, as a company, as a service, what you value in people. And that's just a good delineation line of, you know, we want the people to understand it and we'll do it because that's who will work with us. And I'm with you. I get it. Again, we do non-emergency. I tell the people who are going to advanced school, it's like once you get out of advanced, you're, you need to move on because you will never use your, well, not never, but it's very rare you'll use your skills here and you didn't spend that time and energy to not use your skills. Stay on part time, but go get a, another job. And those, we hold a pretty high standard too. And it's, it's, I ask certain questions that it's not for you. It's not for you. I get that. We're not doing yeah. all be all. That's right. Do you have, when was the last time you had to get on a truck because somebody was calling out? 
Mm. We've run some calls independently recently during the pandemic. Uh, so this year you've been on a truck? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I actually left here one night this year at midnight and drove to Atlanta on a transfer. Mm. My folks were too tired. Okay. Mission with Mission Oregon. We got a job to do. Job's got to get done. Yeah. People are counting on us. So, now, let's dive into that. As a, a leader, I mean, that didn't seem like a sarcastic answer. My folks were too tired. Like, then I came back and fired up. It sounded like you were actually, you know, they were running hard. They needed their sleep. And you stepped in as the top man and your partner, and y'all took that call for them. Well, that's somebody, somebody. That's what I tell my folks. Everybody we go to, it's somebody, somebody. Yeah. Somebody's mom, somebody's dad, somebody's grandmother, brother, daughter, child, whatever. And they needed to get where, to definitive care. And we're mission oriented. You know, get it I love done. Love it. I love it. That, that's, that's good. Um, I man, I could, I could ask so many more questions. You need to, you need to do your own social media talking about everything you've learned in your career and what y'all mm. teach here. <laughs> yeah, I see it. That. I see it. No. You know, somebody over here wouldn't even get on this interview, but that's okay too. At least you do that. Uh, one last question before I get into the, the full wrap up. Being that you've done it for so long and the world has changed so much, talking about the computers and everything else, what is your company, your, your services stance on social media? Because I know you're hiring people that that's all they've ever known and they live on it. Do you encourage some of it? Do you say don't do it without approval or do y'all say no social media about the US? Actually, the, uh, the county has a policy okay. and we have a policy about posting anything about the service without prior approval. So it's approval based. Which seems safe and good. It's not a lockout, There's but you don't risk so much liability. Yeah. And, you know, we just got to have a handle on that. Yeah. A, a, a neighboring fire department up north, they had that issue where the firefighter got on and was very negative and bitter about people calling, not getting out of the way. And, and, and they had a policy of not doing anything at all. So I think it was just a, a cry to be fired type of deal but yeah it's it's great last day yeah yeah <laughs> so before you get last questions that's a great it's a great last day you've said that a couple of times what do you say are the two answers when you work for somebody uh, there's only two okay yes sir or yes ma'am uh-huh or i quit I, I love it it is people don't seem to understand and don't, that. And don't think we're, we're not open to sure uh conversations and all that but the bottom line is if you, uh, me too if my, mm -hmm. my guy, my county administrator tells me I want you to get this done, uh, you know, I don't question that. Uh, I get it done. That's what he pays me to do. Get the job done. Get the job done. Get the job done. I'm about to start putting that in my interviews. There's only two answers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, or yes, we ever get to, no, I'm out. It's a great that, last day. That quote actually came from a good friend of mine. Yeah. And, uh, I liked it. It uh, was it, good. It, it was right. It was, it was right. good. And you asked me earlier, and, and I forgot, but I do want to get back to it. Okay. About how do you pick out who's going to get promoted? Yes. You know, there's people been on this planet 85 years that's never done anything. Yes. Right? They've never been a productive citizen, never held a job, never done really anything. Just because you've been somewhere longer mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily make you the person for the job. Right. The person that is self-motivated and mission-oriented that gets stuff done and you don't have to chase them, that's, that's who gets promoted. That's exactly That's what right. you're supposed to do. Yeah. That thing, and it hadn't made any noise. That thing makes noise. When yeah. They paid us out. Yeah. Do whatever that says. Come in. Do your work. Go home. It's well, not hard. Yeah, I imagine you have some kind of a house day policy, but I'm looking at it's, it's all laminate flooring. Which gets dirty really fast. Yeah, the person that, that just opts to take the room and clean it out, I'm sure you're seeing that. And the person that'll clean up all the coffee mugs in the morning because they had a long night the day before. That's the, it's the little things that matter. Yeah, anybody can run calls, right? Not everybody can run them politely at three in the morning and well, and well but you know, uh, and not everybody has their checklist together as they need to have, but that, that is great. Um, and something else we try to do yeah. here, I think makes us a little unique. Okay. Is we don't have the bare minimum requirements on our trucks, equipment rise to pass, the, to meet the standards right. of the state. We try to give them the right tools that they can use that they yeah. need to do a good job. 
Yeah, I noticed you had the power cots on your truck, and yeah. you, you, y'all were showing us the the Luca device, the Luca style device, and and yeah, fluid warmers, yeah. Brosley bags, and, and you know yeah. even that pediatric bag, they check it off every day, right, to be sure everything's yeah. good. It's not gonna be on your calendar when you're gonna go to that child not breathing. Yeah, it's not gonna be on your calendar. You gotta be ready, and they need the tools to be able to handle that. Yes. Yeah, that, that, and that, we could go, we could do a whole nother interview on budgeting based on those things and pulling teeth and what, and everybody who doesn't understand asks you why you have to do that, but I won't do that. I think you'll like this quote. Chuck Savage told me this one time because he was a supervisor and he had somebody that's like, I've been a medic 20 years, I got 20 years experience. And without hesitation goes, apparently you didn't make it a learning experience <laughs> and just moved on. And to that end of just because you've been around forever doesn't make you right for the job. That's right. Yeah, you gotta, you, you gotta be bold enough to make mistakes and smart enough to learn from them. So, but the four questions I ask at the end of every episode is just the first thing that comes to mind for you, right? It's not really a gotcha, it's just a don't hesitate and overthink it. What do you love about EMS and your job? Well, it's been a good career for me. I, I like helping people and, uh, I just, I enjoy to be able to, uh, do my own thinking, my own diagnosing, if you yeah. please and my own treatment. I don't have a doctor there telling me, well, you need to do this, do that. We need right. To figure out what's going on, take care of it. Right. What does helping others mean to you? It's just I could go and uh, lay down, especially in a community like this. Like I said, we know a lot of our patients. Yeah. You know, there's only 30 some odd thousand people in this county. And uh, knowing that they got the best possible care that we could give them, you know, I mean, that's, that's my goal. I got you. In your career, what's one of the biggest things that you've seen change in EMS that was needed to happen? You know, uh, I think the uh, the technology, just in general, that's that's been a huge improvement, in my opinion. The capnography, like we discussed earlier, that's that's huge when people yeah. are having respiratory issues. There it goes. So uh, we'll cut we'll cut the pertinence out. So when that happens, I go do whatever that says. Go do that. Seizure in the middle of the road. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to leave the, the tones in and all that. I uh, will take out the pertinence, okay. right, for that, but um, that's great. Okay, so we're talking about health people. You were talking about changing technology. Um, well, so you're talking about changing technology when the tones drop, but that's also changed. You got CAD now, computer assisted dispatching, and you even have, well, does Wayne County do the, I think it's called EMTD, or the Emergency Dispatcher Certification for Dispatchers? Uh, no, no, it didn't. Okay. They have some type of certification through the state to do EMD, I guess mm-hmm. what it's called. EMD. EMD, yeah, yeah, that's it, EMD, yes. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we have that. But some of the technology that's good is like now, uh, we're doing our reports on our iPads, mm-hmm. our patient reports, and we've got a link, a system built in there. Um, it's called Active 911. I don't know if you're familiar with it, mm-hmm. but when that call is dispatched, it comes through to that iPad, too. And even the uh, navigation, yes, it'll take you right. Yeah, to the right phone. all there. Yeah, it'll show you who else is in route if fires come in or where they're at. And yeah. it's, it's now, some cool stuff. But that's instead of getting out the map at two o'clock in the morning yeah. with a flashlight, uh-huh. and, and that's the way we used to have to do it. Yeah, I mean, the, nowadays it's just a, a fun team building exercise. Here's my map book from 1990. Yep. Give me to this address and we, having people figure out what page. We still actually have those in the county. Nice. But, uh, you know. Because GPS isn't perfect. That's right. Yeah. That's a fact. Uh, what is the biggest problem you're facing right now with Wayne County? Finding good qualified, and I said good. Yeah. Qualified paramedics uh, to fill our open positions. That seems to be the answer everybody gives is, is some version of staffing. and. You know, in yeah. all professions, there's good doctors mm-hmm. and others, plumbers, electricians, yeah. paramedics, the list. Is endless. There's good ones and others. Yeah. We want good ones. No, I understand that, and it sounds like you're willing to do what it takes. Obviously, you got to track yourself. The truth, you're willing to do what it takes. 
to wait for the right people to come along. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we've got a great medical director. We've got a fantastic set of protocols that my deputy chief built. And uh, they're in all the trucks. They're on the computer. And they pretty much got their blessing to do everything they're trying to do. Nice. And you can always phone a friend if you're not comfortable in going by them. Exactly. So, you know, they, they have liberty here to figure out what's wrong and treat the patient. They don't have to call, well, I want to put this one on oxygen, or I want to do CPAP, yeah. or I want to do what you're trying to do. Yeah. Take care of it. I've, ne- I've never understood that, where if a doctor's so scared they want you to call for everything, you need a new medical director. So I didn't do all the schooling and put my time in the field to be handheld. I'm not a nurse. And no offense to nurses, but I mean, they're not allowed on certain levels to do what they actually were trained to do in hospital. Yeah. Let them do what they're trained to do. Let us do what we're trained to do. Well, fortunately, we've got a, a board, AR board certified uh, medical director that trained at Shands, Jacksonville. And uh, nice. he knows what we do and what we're capable of doing. He has confidence to allow us to do that. That is, that is perfect. That is perfect. So with one EMS, what we're doing is bringing the conversations from from thought leaders like yourself and, and EMS leaders and the boots on the ground people all the way to citizens and to the state DPH office and even the senators to try to get perspective built for everybody to see the realities and pull the veil back, if you will. Because tell me if you disagree. In, in my experience, my 20 years in EMS, a lot of it was ask forgiveness, not permission. And we hide what we do and we don't ever want anybody to watch us. And then you get misperceptions and people don't understand why things happen. So we're, we're trying to build that conversation and in that vein and that explanation, what is the conversation that one EMS could have for you that would make your life better? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm concerned about uh, people not going into the profession in general and I, you know, I saw that, and I, I can't tell you how many years ago, because time kind of, you get my age, time gets, it's just time. But anyway, there was a nursing shortage nationwide back, I'm going to say 25 years ago. And they were hurt. Like yeah. they were hurt. I mean, they couldn't find nurses. And until they got the pay, mm-hmm. where it was competitive to draw people in that field, there's been uh, physician shortages in pay. I mean, all mm-hmm. professions go through. Right. cycles of having a lot of people and not enough people. So I think we're at the point where, you know, ideally it would make it more competitive with a with an RN as far as pay goes because it's a fun job. I worked in the hospital two years uh, full time in the ER here. And at that time, it's been some years back, they allowed me to be a paramedic. So I could yes. do all my paramedic skills. Right. I was intubating uh, people that needed intubating mm-hmm. and doing working codes and, you know, um, so what they do, you know, I, they deserve it. They deserve that. Yeah. And I'm, I've lost a, a full-time medic last year. I'm losing another one this upcoming year because they're going to RN school. And and I, I certainly have no ill will sure. towards them for that. You know, I'm all about bettering your, you know, yourself and your education. But, um, you know, I think that's, that's a big thing uh, with people, you know. If you want to go get a job at Hobby Lobby, it pays the same. You know, what, yeah. what's your point for coming here and working 24 hour shifts? And you got to want to do it and mm-hmm. they need to pay people to do it. Yeah. Meet, meet the needs of the people as they getting satisfaction out of their job. Absolutely. It's a very gratifying job when you yeah. are able to help somebody. You know, it is. It is. We're not, uh, <laughs> We're not building lawnmowers, repairing lawnmowers here, <laughs> right? Building cogs, you know, making donuts. That's no, not what we're not, we do. That's not what we do here. Right. It takes it takes a mindset, a lifestyle, and an education to do what we do. You want to build small engines? They got the same program at the technical school. Yeah. We're coming here working on people, yeah. right? There's no margin for error. <laughs> so. That sounds like an EFS instructor I heard. One of my friends, when she went to paramedic school, the master instructor came to somebody down the road from her on the table and handed them McDonald's applications like, you keep failing your test, you might just want to fill this out instead. That's right. You know, so there's always that. But All I'd right. like to see that where it would be, you know. Competitive. And, and be attractive based. to people for a career. Yeah. You know, because it's a rewarding, self-rewarding job. Yeah. But, you know, you shouldn't have to work two jobs. If, you, if you're doing something yeah. for a career, 
you shouldn't have to work two jobs if that's how you make your living and yeah. provide for your family. That shouldn't be a requirement. I gotta have two jobs. I'm never home. Yeah, it's the bane of the EMS existence. There. Yeah. And then, I mean, we gotta, we gotta wrap it up. But it, it, so when that's happening, they, they're getting burned out. You know, the phrase is, I don't get paid enough for this, which is a bad mentality. It, it really is a cry for help. But then that plays into patient care where you miss stuff or you're mean to somebody because they're a regular and they call. You think they're just being alcoholics or, or just lazy or whatever. And they actually have a real issue in that burnout. It just leads to so many other issues. And I mean, we could talk for days on that. And those are the calls that'll burn you. Those frequent yeah. flyers, as we call them. Yeah. Um, those will, that will burn you. Uh, and I'll leave you with this. Okay. The two most dangerous things we do, in my opinion, is driving. Yeah. And refusals. Yes. If they yeah. called you, we don't need to tell them they're okay because we don't know that they're okay. We can check what we check, but it, that's just my opinion. Liability-wise, yeah. driving those trucks and leaving people after they called us, it's a dangerous turf to trail. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll have to have you back on and talk about both of those things. So thank you. Thank you for having us here at Wayne County. It, it's, it's, it's so enlightening. Um, I love that you are willing to sit and talk about the things that need to be talked about. You know, with, 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 there's been too much fear in EMS and too many gotchas and we're trying to take all that away. Cause at the end of the day, this, these conversations is what brings change and, and perception and perspective brings us together. And at the end of it all, when you get off shift, when you're on shift, when you're on those calls, at the end of the day, we're all one EMS.